this is the last um, presentation of the nervous system before we begin in the endocrine system. Um, this, uh, uh, this is going to be talking about neurotransmitters and pain control. This is what I spent most of my time um, doing in anesthesia. It was my preference to figure out the best way to provide pain control and good anesthesia for my patients. So number 10, um, the nervous system is going to um, directly talk about how we prevent some of these impulses from traveling through the um, neurons. So I'm going to talk about the neurotransmitters. That's what we're blocking and pain control. And then I'll do some case presentations. So the neurotransmitters, a couple examples. The first is um, a motor end plate where the um, muscles, muscle fibers are being stimulated from the neurotransmitters. And then the other are the synapses, and those are more in the autonomic nervous system. Those are places where we also block with things like spinals and epidurals. So neurotransmitters are the chemicals that transport this information. Now, do you remember from previous um, lecture, what is the difference between a hormone and a neurotransmitter? Hormones travel in the blood, neurotransmitters, travel through nerves and synapses. And if you guessed it, both are correct. So the endocrine system is driven by hormones secreted by endocrine cells um, or neurosecretory cells. They travel in the blood. Whereas in the nervous system, the nerve cells actually um, produce the neurotransmitters, they travel through the nervous system, the nervous their ex axons, and they um, dump their contents into these synapses, um, either with synapses or at the neuromuscular junctions. The three most common neurotransmitters are um, first acetylcholine, um, abbreviated ACH, that is at the motor end plate. Dopamine produced in the brain, it's associated with reward and memory. And then of course, norepinephrine and epinephrine. Epinephrine also, the name you hear all the time is adrenaline. Uh, and that is produced with acute stress. So of those three or categories, epinephrine and norepinephrine put together, which neurotransmitter is by far the most abundant? And if you guessed it, it's acetylcholine. Think about all the muscles in your body that you're moving constantly. So acetylcholine um, travels within the central nervous system, um, produced both in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The junctions uh, are between the motor end plate, the nerves, and then this is the um, muscles, the myosin and actin fiber, fibers that are contracting and relaxing. Norepinephrine and epinephrine, also called adrenaline, they are both neurotransmitters and hormones. Um, they can be produced in the central nervous system then become an, a neurotransmitter. If they're produced in the adrenal medulla, they go into the bloodstream and then they become a hormone. So next is dopamine. It's also a neurotransmitter and a hormone. It's produced in the central nervous system. It regulates skeletal muscle tone as a neurotransmitter. And it's that really good feel good hormone. So it also responds as a hormone. So the case presentation case, case example is with Parkinson's disease. People that are unable to produce dopamine have these blank facial expressions. They tilt, they have that forward tilt posture. Um, they lose their, their fluidity of motion. So they have a very short shuffling gait. And then they have tremors. Um, 
of their extremities and their head, except when they're asleep. You can tell when someone with Parkinson's disease is asleep, they don't have any of the tremors. And the pathophysiology, if you were to look in the brain, and by the way, this is an axial cut, right here, axial cut, in the substantia nigra, you start losing, um, and you start developing, you start losing this coloration, losing your substantia nigra. And then you start building up these things called Lewy bodies. So with Parkinson's disease, they lose dopamine and the causes could be idiopathic, which means it's a term, medical term for nobody knows what's going on, um, genetic and environmental. So part of the problem is that they're not producing dopamine and you would think it would be easy to give someone dopamine, dopamine as a replacement, but it's extremely difficult because um, it's hard to get dopamine from a pill form injection to cross through the blood brain barrier. So there's mainly um, no cure. You have to treat the symptoms, um, medications that in, agonist means that precursors to dopamine and L-dopa to try to increase their own production of dopamine. And then now they're starting to do microelectrode brain stimulation to reduce the motor symptoms. And one of the most famous people with Parkinson's disease that's been um, fairly well treated is Michael J. Fox from uh, multiple programs, but Back to the Future is the one I know best. So this with, is with Michael J. Fox with about um, you know, 20 years of having to deal with Parkinson's disease. So actually that say that 30 years because that was 91, excuse me. Okay, so let's go on to pain control, my favorite um, topic. So you have um, different options for pain control. Um, of course, barring things like the over-the-counter medications, Tylenol and Motrin, non-steroidals, you can go with narcotics, a peripheral nerve block, or the spinal slash epidural blocks, also called neuroaxial blocks because they're blocking nerves uh, before they exit the central nervous system. So first of all, narcotic pain medications can be either oral or intravenous. The types of medications you've heard about, um, morphine, dilated, fentanyl, codeine, oxycontin, lortab, methadone, these are all examples of narcotic medications. And they have a lot of problems. Um, most commonly um, is the fear of giving too much and have patients uh, become unresponsive, unresponsive, but also the fear of uh, over sedation and stopping the breathing. Um, and of course, nausea is a big problem. Constipation is a big problem. So first of all, spinals and epidurals, let's talk about them. Um, they target the nerves before they leave the spinal cord. So their targeted place is within a spinal block in the spinal fluid or an epidural space. So they're very central. So when you do a spinal or an epidural, you'll place it along the, the spinal cord. And so this is the posterior view. So if I'm doing a spinal block and I put it like say L2, 3, ether, everything from this point down becomes blocked, both sensory and motor. So both legs are blocked. And it depends on the kind of medication you're using. Um, it can be um, anywhere from two hours to six hours and sometimes even more if you add other medications to it. And as a refresher, um, the epidural is placed in the epidural space. Epi means above the dura and a catheter is 
placed. And so this can go in anywhere along the back, as long as you're careful with your needle and don't go into the spinal fluid. And the spinal goes all the way through the dura and it's a single shot. So it's going about L1, 2, anywhere below L1, 2. It's of shorter duration, but the catheter of the epidural could be left behind. And a, a review of everything about spinals and epidurals is in the neuroanatomy number five. Okay, so I want to talk about one of my favorite things is the um, peripheral nerve blocks, because you can, instead of numbing up uh, both legs with a spinal or an epidural, you can numb up just a segment of the leg or a segment of um, a foot. So it's putting the medications directly around the nerves themselves after they've passed through the spinal cord. So this can supplement pain medications or it can be done instead of having pain medications at all in lieu of uh, narcotic pain medications. So here's a case example, Bunyan's 25 year old woman with a painful left foot. She can't wear um, sandals and has difficult time finding good footwear. She's scheduled for outpatient bunionectomy. So ectomy means removal of. So removal of her bunions, bunionectomy. So what would be her best, pain, best option for pain control? Would you want oral narcotics? It's going to be a pretty uncomfortable procedure. Notice how it's going to have to include the cut here, working on the bone. The periosteum of the bone is very uncomfortable. So this is going to be postoperatively very uncomfortable. So your choices are oral narcotics, a left ankle nerve block, or a spinal block. And since she's outpatient, you would want to choose a left ankle nerve block. So you're just numbing up her left foot so she can walk still. And using a crutch, she can get around no problem. So again, the best advantage is only one of her feet are numb, no side effects from narcotics. And this is where you'll learn your um, anatomy and know that looking at the foot, you've got these three um, major or four areas, depending on where you're gonna um, in do the injection to inject around these nerves to give good pain control. Okay, the next presentation, this is a 65 year old woman, actually that I took care of um, with uh, kidney failure from her diabetes. She's also got heart disease. She's scheduled for a venous access catheter shunt for dialysis in her upper arm. So she's at high risk for a general anesthesia. Um, we want her to be happy, healthy, and we don't want um, to risk a deep general anesthetic or a lot of um, narcotics. So I put this little mark here. This is where her incision is going to go. And these segments, T2, these are this thoracic nerves, C4 level. These are all these nerves coming out of her spinal cord. And so the, the um, incision is going to cover all this area. So it's gonna extend all across these dermatomes, cervical fifth and sixth and the thoracic first level. So where is the best place to add local anesthesia to get adequate pain control? Would it be at the incision site or at the brachial plexus? And I'm hoping you're gonna say at the brachial plexus. So brachial plexus is pretty cool. It's where all these nerves come out of these levels of your neck. And then they all kind of combine to form this cord-like structure. Um, and you can, the great thing about it is if you look at it on ultrasound, you can actually find, go back, you can find that the nerves uh, travel along with the arteries and veins. So with an ultrasound, you look for the pulsations. And if you don't clearly see the nerves, you can simply inject around 
the um, arteries, knowing where everything lies. So for a uh, brachial plexus block, you can um, inject any of these three um, injection sites. The higher or the more proximal, like that first number one syringe, you'll get um, nerves as they affect the shoulder and all the way down the arm. Two, you'll get the upper arm and hand. And then if you have a more distal site you wanna inject, you can do the axillary approach and inject around the artery. Now, the one thing I have to say, I know you're, uh, the fear of injecting into the artery is a, would be a problem, but every time you do an injection with these um, nerve blocks, these peripheral nerve blocks, you always aspirate the um, syringe to make look for blood before you inject the medications. So the patients can still receive um, IV sedation, but you don't need as deep of a general anesthetic or as much IV sedation. So this is really great for these patients that have kidney failure, heart disease, other medical problems. This is a, um, this is a little video that I took of the patient that we talked about, the 65 year old woman with renal failure. She's having an infraclavicular, so it's going underneath the clavicle. Um, that's the ultrasound probe watching where the needle is going. And I'll show you what that looks like. So that needle is just, it's been numbed up, by the way, the skin's numbed up. And that needle is going just parallel to the ultrasound probe. Now we're going to swing over to the ultrasound. And here you're looking for the pulsations of the artery. Right here, the pulsations of the artery. So all we have to do, here's the needle coming in. We just watch the needle coming in and then start injecting. And as you do inject, you can start seeing the vis how visible these nerves are. So you don't inject into the nerves. You just inject in the sheath that goes around the artery and then it'll start covering the nerves. And here's a nerve right here. It's pretty easy now to see the nerve. Here's a nerve being surrounded by local anesthetic. So all of these nerves are surrounding um, the artery of the brain. These are, these are um, nerves of the brachial plexus. And so this is her in the recovery room having uh, no pain medication required at all. This uh, also is a showing how the medication is injected under the clavicle and going towards this, these bundle of nerves that surround the artery that's coming out. So that right here, it becomes a subclavian artery. All right. So this, um, when you use an ultrasound, if you have a problem with trying to find the exact placement, you can just come in and you can look for arteries. And then on ultrasound, you can um, hit a little button and it will show color Doppler. So you don't necessarily um, tell, like the color doesn't tell you whether it's an artery or vein, but the pulsations tell you it's an artery. So this is the artery right here. That, so all you have to do with placement of these blocks is know where the artery is, know your anatomy. And you can actually, even though these, this is the artery, you can see these little nerves. They look like grapes right here that surround the artery in this location. What are the risks with this infraclavicular block? Injection into an artery or a vein, a pneumothorax, which is also another term for a dropped lung, bleeding, infection, or all are possible. 
and I'm guessing you're gonna say all are possible. So that needle is very close to the lung. So this is kind of scary, especially if you have a person with lung disease and they're dependent upon two good functioning lungs. If you drop the lung, you can put a chest tube in, but it's just, it's just a lot of paperwork, that's for sure. So there's, these can be broken up into proximal. Remember proximal means closer to the midline. Um, proximal blocks, and that's what we've shown here with these um, blocks that go here close to the neck. These are good for like a rotator cuff surgery. This is good for um, upper arm surgery, like the patient I showed you. And, um, and then this axillary block is great for the lower arm or hand. And the closer, of course, you go, the proximal blocks, the more you have risk for a pneumothorax. Um, but the great thing about them is they do cover more nerves. The distal blocks, uh, fewer nerves are blocked and you don't get the risk of dropping a lung. So the next case presentation, another patient I took care of, this is a 72 year old man um, kidney failure, diabetes, heart disease, and he's scheduled for venous access shunt for dialysis at the wrist. Um, and he is also very high risk for general anesthesia. Now, you can do, just FYI, you can do uh, a shunt at different places in the arm for dialysis access. Um, usually people get uh, dialysis access catheters lower at the wrist. And then if, they, if they're inadequate, they don't connect well, they just start moving up the arm until like for her, that other woman, um, she needed it, she'd lost, she didn't have a good shunt when it was placed at the wrist. So she was having a new placement up higher in her arm. So this is showing his injection site. So I need to know, um, I need to know what kind of nerves I'm going to inject in order to get that blue area, that blue line. So it's gonna extend across the radian, radial nerve, the median nerve, and this other nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve. So knowing my anatomy, all of these, all of these come under the armpit axillary approach. And then I also know where those nerves surround the axillary artery. The axillary artery, artery is, is the same as the subclavian. It's just a different name for a new location. And this is um, the ultrasound, how the ultrasound looks. I'll play that for you in a minute. But the great thing about doing um, the axillary approach is you can see the, the needle so much better because of the way that the needle lies in relation to the ultrasound probe. So this is the axillary artery and the needles coming in. And I know that my nerves surround the axillary artery. There's one behind, up here, and down here, and then the musculocutaneous is right here. So you'll inject a little here, here, and then try to move up here and then add volume to spread it around the axillary artery. So this is the needle coming in, and the needle is a little bit on the blunt side, so it kind of pushes structures away and it helps so that you don't inject directly into a vessel or in directly into the nerve itself. You're trying to get into the sheath, the nerve sheath. So it kind of pushes it away and I'm going on top of the axillary artery and trying to get behind it to inject medication. And that you see with that um, echo Geneity of the of the bubbles. That's the medication coming in, surrounding the nerves, surrounding the artery. And before the injection, again, before the injection, um, you'll aspirate the um, needle, the syringe, to make sure that you're not injecting into a blood vessel. This is a case presentation. This is. Um, 
when I was traveling overseas. This is another option, another important um, scenario for doing nerve blocks in low resource setting, settings. This um, guy was 20 years old and he had a gunshot wound to his hand his low, and lower arm. Um, and he uh, actually was able to get a couple nerve blocks, one for the surgery and for pain control a couple days later. Oops, let me show you that again. It looks like there was a little bit more. Here we go. So you can see up here in the ultrasound, there is the axillary artery and the needle coming across to go behind, above and behind the uh, axillary what? artery. All right. Another option, um, I would also consider this a low resource setting. This is actually at my farm. And uh, this is uh, called as bears and blocks because I have a, a uh, pit bull mix that um, found a small bear and chased the bear up a tree and then kept jumping at the tree um, so much that she tore her own ACL. Didn't, didn't get the bear, but she was persistent. So she came home from the veteran, veterinarians and was in terrible pain. Here you see her wearing the cone of shame after her ACL repair. And here's the incision coming right across that back leg. And she was miserable. And she is a very agreeable animal. So what I did is look up where the um, nerve distribution for a dog would be. And it's surprisingly very similar to a human. The femoral nerve supplies that area of where the incision is. And again, the nerve travels in the same path as the artery. So she allowed me to just lay her on her back and I used a very tiny, tiny needle and felt her pulse and went lateral to the pulse and did this blind. So basically, here is a person. This is what a person's leg would look like. So a dog is very similar. All you have to do is fill these pulsations and then inject lateral to the pulsations and the femoral nerve is right there. So this is a situation you have no needle, you have needles, you have local anesthetics, you don't have an ultrasound, you can still at least attempt a nerve block um, and the risks are much lower and you have a much happier dog. So remember the nerves run with vessels and in this area, the nerve lies lateral to the femoral artery. So two years later, we adopted um, actually a Rottweiler. Um, this also dog uh, being adopted to a farm, coming into a farm, crazy to chase deer. And she ended up tearing both her ACLs and had both surgeries done at the same time. This time, um, the veterinarian allowed me to come in to um, the operating room. And after she was placed under general anesthesia, I used his ultrasound and we placed bilateral femoral nerve blocks. So when she came home, she was, she, uh, she came home the same day and was particularly comfortable as you can see, not requiring the cone of shame. So in summary, neurotransmitters, travel through the nervous system. Um, you can block them either using a central block, neuroaxial blocks like spinals or epidurals, or you can go more peripheral and you can do that with motor plexuses or you can get the individual nerves. And neuroaxial blocks, remember it blocks everything, sensory, motor, sympathetics. So knowing that it blocks your sympathetics and your sympathetics keep your vascular tone, 
you can get very low um, blood pressure. So that's an important thing to know about someone who's having a spinal or an epidural, that you can have hypotension. So that's important to make sure you have an IV, adequate IV and hydration. Peripheral nerve blocks, you can either go um, central or more peripheral, not central, but more proximal rather. Um, you do get sensory and motor blockade, but you don't get the sympathetic blockade, so you don't get hypotension. So any questions about this, please leave comments in the, um, in this, you know, under the comments 